Well, this morning we've been talking about different and various body parts. And as we have been saying time and time again, each part is needed by the other. Because you see, if you don't have one part, the other part suffers. And that's just what Ray was talking about, talking about the ears and how the ears have different functions. Not only are they for hearing, but they are also for balance. A lot of this uh, comes directly from Scripture. And at present, we're in the middle of a series known as Steps to Discipleship. And when we're looking at Steps to Discipleship, we have gone and discovered a few things. You see, we're asking the question, what would happen if we as a church took seriously the command of Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations? Well, what really would a disciple look like? So we've been spending some time looking at this. We're talking about, well, a disciple is one who accepts uh, what Jesus has done for them and has this assurance of salvation. We have Jesus as Lord over our lives and accept his directing and our leading in our lives. A disciple is one who understands the indwelling of Christ. A disciple is one who simply goes and shares their story, what Christ is doing in them. And last week here we had Denise share her powerful story of how Christ is there even when things don't go right. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the body. Now the text where a lot of these things come from is in 1 Corinthians. So if you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Because this is where Paul talks about the different parts of the body. And just imagine that this was the first time that you were looking at it. This was the first time that you were reading it. And you're trying to put together what Paul is saying here. 1 Corinthians 12, I'm just going to start at verse 12 because this is what it says. Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. There are many parts, says Paul, okay? But there is only one body. He's making this point. And he's saying somehow this is associated with Christ. In verse 14 we read, Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Fair enough. Many parts make up this body. If you skip down to verse 18, because in between, he gives the examples that we have looked at today. There's the example of the ear, the example of the eye, etc. In verse 18, it says, But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Okay, this body, whatever it is, God is in control of it. He is the one who has formed it. He is the one who has put it together where it is he wants each one. In the middle of verse 24, after giving a few more examples of feet and, and uh, things like that, verse 24, it says, God is the one who has put this body together. God is the one who is control. God is the one who has put it all together. So verse 25, there should be no division in the body because each part has the same value as any other part. They are needed together. But that its parts should have equal concern for one each other. Verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. And now Paul comes and he tells us exactly what he was talking about. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27. It says the following, Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of of it. Paul says what I'm really talking about here is the body of Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, if you follow him, then you are a part of this body. And in the very next sentence, it talks about and God has placed in the church all the different gifts and all the different things that he goes and lists there. So we can see that Paul is really talking about the church, the body of Christ, how much God values us, how God wants us each to have and play a part in what he has done because God is the one who has created it. God is the one who has put it together. We each have a part to play. Now you are the body of Christ and each of you has a part of it. 
I've got a confession to make. When I go away on holidays, there's something that I like to do when the opportunity is there, and not a travelling holiday, but a sit by the ocean and watch the waves roll in. Whenever I get the opportunity, I like to do a jigsaw puzzle. Do we have any follow jigsaw puzzle fans here? Yeah, I, I, it's just something about having a jigsaw puzzle and putting the pieces in certain places. It's really cool. And I've discovered, person that I am, that you can actually buy really cheap jigsaw puzzles at secondhand shops. You go into a secondhand shop and inevitably there's a bookcase full of novels and, and then there's some jigsaw puzzles, usually two, three, four or five dollars. And they're a great source until you get right towards the very end of the puzzle. And when you get right towards the very end of the puzzle, you realise something, that there's a piece missing. That ever happened to you? Isn't that frustrating? You see this piece missing, and something's not quite right, and your eye automatically goes to what is missing. Our text today says this. It says, now you are the body of Christ and each of you is a part of it. So the message is simply this. When each one says yes to Christ, they become a part of his church, a part of his body. And without you playing your part, it's like a piece is missing in the bigger picture. A piece that God intended. And the pictures that others see of God is not quite complete. We are his body. Yet for many, this emphasis seems to have been forgotten. We focus on our personal relationship with Christ. This is vital. This absolutely has to happen. We have to have this personal relationship for Christ. But for many, the church seems to become less important for average Christians today. Some Christians say, why come to church when I can stay at home and I can watch 3ABN? Oh, really? Church is where you come together. Church is where we rely on one another. Church is the relationship that we have. It's true that individuals make choices to accept Jesus as Saviour, but the moment we accept him as Saviour, we become part of his body. We are part of a larger home. We are part of his family. And the biblical reality is that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. Something bigger than ourselves. What does it mean to be a part of the church? What is the church here to do? What is the church for? Well, I've already mentioned this text this morning in Matthew 28. Matthew 28 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As you're, even as you're making disciples, you can see this is a community thing, something that we need to do in community. This is what you are to do. These were Christ's last words on earth. Important words. Important words. And so we can see it wasn't long after this that Peter is preaching away at Pentecost. And as he is preaching, all of a sudden towards the end, we see in Acts 2 verse 41 that it says, Those who accepted this message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. What were they added to? What did they become a part of? Well, verse 42, so 47 tells us, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's what they were added to. They were added to the church. They were added to the body of Christ. What interests me is what happens in between those two. And if you know your Bible, you know exactly what it is. This is a description of the first church, the early church. Acts 2 verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. 
Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added daily to those who were coming apart of the body of Christ, whose pieces were coming together. Let me show you something interesting here. We go and have a look and we see that we have this command of making or growing disciples, how they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We can also see that they are sharing with each other the good things that the Lord was doing in their lives. Peter sharing Jesus with the crowd and the people who were part of the church sharing what was going on among themselves. We see that they were fellowshipping or they were connecting together. In fact, it says they devoted themselves to fellowship. I love the text in 1 John. First, First John 1 verse 3, where it says, We're proclaiming what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. We want you to come and be a part of our fellowship so that our joy can be complete. And then we see that they are serving each other as each one had need. They were looking after everyone's needs. They were putting it all together. And then finally we see they were worshipping God through prayer and through praise. Now we can worship God individually, but it's much better. It's, it's, uh, we need to come together to do this as well. This is interesting to me because you look at some of these key words. Growing disciples, sharing, fellowshipping, serving, worshipping. It kind of reminds me of the words that we have behind us. Here you can see this tree. This is the purposes of the church. We are here to grow or go and make disciples. We're here to do it until Jesus comes. And we're to do that as part of the community. That's what God has wanted us to do. And connecting, we must do that in the community that we have. We must do that together. That's the fellowshipping aspect that we were talking about. How well are you connecting with others? Serving, looking after everybody's needs, serving one another. We have sharing, sharing the good news of, uh, of God's love with others, sharing our hope with the world. And then we have the worshipping as well. This is what the church is for. And we need to do it together. We need to do it as a community. As we can see, this is more about God than it is about us. It's about God and who he is and who we are in him. And he invites us into it. And when everyone starts to be a part of it, like our text says, you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it, when we play together, when we play our part, other people begin to see more clearly just who Jesus is. Are you playing the part that God has asked you to play? Where's your commitment level to Christ compared to your commitment level to his body? the church, his community on earth. Can I be honest with you for a little bit? The church is not perfect. Can we erase that from the tape for others? No, it's all right. The church is not perfect. There is a sense of trust and vulnerability in joining a community of human, uh, human believers. And yes, sometimes people get hurt. But according to God's word, one of the most important things for you to do is to experience church. A few weeks ago, we had a baptism here. We read baptismal vows out, and I gave them an alternative vow. Chris Blake wrote, here are 13 things that I wish were in the baptismal vows. Number one had said, I, be I wish this was in our baptismal vow. I believe that the church is not principally a building or an organisation. The church is people. And number two, he wrote, alternative baptismal vows, he said, I wish this was in there. I will not be totally stunned and dejected when church members let me down. I know that God is divine, that his church is human. When I see flaws in my church, I will look to Jesus, who died for all of us while we were yet flawed. I will also persevere in looking for and working towards good in my church. Yes, there are issues. There are hassles. 
But I love what Ellen White says. She says, Enfeebled and defective as it may appear, the church is the one object upon whom God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. It is the theatre of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power and transform hearts. That's what he delights to do. He delights to reveal his power, to create followers of him, to delight in his power as we connect, serve, share, worship and grow more and more like him. This is his body. Some people still give all sorts of reasons why they don't want to belong. I want to follow Jesus, but I just don't want to be a part of the church. Well, that really doesn't make sense because the church is one of the places where you live out what it means to be a Christian. That's like saying, I want to be a football player, but I don't want to join a footy team. Doesn't make sense. I want to be a tuba player, but I don't want to be part of an orchestra. Have you ever heard a tuba on its own? Just asking. Just asking. I'm a bee, but I don't want to be part of a hive. I'm a soldier, but I don't want to be part of an army. A Christian without a church family is an orphan. And God meant us to be part of a family. Ephesians 2 verse 19. You are members of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. You belong. This is family. God has given you a special part to play. We are family together. When you were born, you automatically became a part of the human race. But you have to choose to belong to the family of God, to the church. I've shared this with you before, but I love it. Richard Rice, Adventist author, he says the following. He says, suppose we could ask the apostles, John or Paul, a question that people often ask today. Can I be a Christian without joining the church? Isn't it enough for me to accept Jesus as my saviour and to have a strong relationship with him? What would the apostles say? My guess is that they wouldn't understand the question. As Paul describes it, the experience of becoming a Christian involves becoming part of the community that Jesus established. He told the Christians in Corinth, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Similarly, for John... The mark of being Jesus' follower is to love fellow disciples. Love each other as I have loved you. What you are together, they assert, is more fundamental and more important than anything you can be by yourselves. When you choose to follow Jesus, you choose to become a part of his community, a part of his body. And it all fits together. God has placed every part in the way, just the way that he wants it. If not, the picture of Jesus that we portray is not complete. Rick Warren recently wrote the following. He said, The greatest need in the world today is to release the energy bottled up in believers who are doing nothing for the kingdom of God. It's time for the church to rise up and be church. The church is the body of Christ. But it seems like our hands and feet have been amputated and most of the time we're just a big mouth. It's time for the church to stop being known for what we're against and start being known for what we stand for. Grace, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, salvation, new life in Jesus Christ. It's time for the church to be church. And our text today says this, guess what? You are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. It, it, it makes it clear. We are all connected to each other. You know the song, The Leg Bones Connected to the Knee Bone? We are all connected to one another. We are all a part of the, uh, of the church. And because of this, I can no longer think of myself in isolation. It's no longer just me. I am me as a Christian member, as a body of Christ. This has to change how I think about myself and how I think about others. It makes me more loving. It makes me more caring. It makes me more available. Because, hey, we're family. We are family. Several centuries ago, in a mountain village in Europe, someone was deciding, what legacy can I leave for the, my village. He decided that he would go and build a church. 
And so that's what he did. He went and built this church. And it was a magnificent church. And as people came on the opening day, they came and they marveled at this fantastic church that he had built. They looked at the architecture. They looked at all the things that he had designed and all the things that he had made. And then somebody noticed something. They said, how do we light this place? Where are the lamps? How is the church to be lighted? The builder pointed to some of the brackets in the wall. Then he gave each family a lamp which they were to bring with them every time they came to worship. He says, every time you are here in the area where you are seated will light up. Each time you are not here, the area will be dark. This is to remind you that whenever you fail to come to church, some parts of God's house will be dark. Now we all know the church is a lot more than just meeting together for an hour a week. But this is where we come to praise, to celebrate, to worship together. Without you, it's just not the same. Hebrews 10 says this, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Because we are the body of Christ, we come together to act as a body, to worship God as a body, to experience body life, to support once and one another at least once a week. In other words, when you don't participate in corporate worship, you are losing part of the joy and privilege of being part of the body of Christ. The story is told of a mother knocking on her son's door and saying, son, it's 10 o'clock, you've got to get up, you've got to go to church. Go away, I don't want to. Knock on the door again. Son, come on, you've got to go. It's time for you to go to church. I don't want to, but it's time for you to go. Give me two reasons why I should go to church today. Number one, says the mum, you're 44 years old, and number two, you're the pastor. You need to go. <laughs> yeah, there are times where we don't want to, times where we go and do other things. But this, we are part of the body. And a body comes together, we celebrate who we are. When we do not come together, we lose out on that connection. It's not a matter of having to go to church, it's a natural function of the body. The church is more than just what we do here. It's a function of the body going out into the world. Again, Richard Rice says this, It is a spiritual as well as biological law that nothing survives in isolation. Separated from each other, members of the church have no more life than severed body parts. Only in togetherness do any of us have spiritual life. Connecting to the body of Christ is not just the best environment for spiritual flourishing, it is also our only chance of survival. As I read that, I thought, who do I know who is no longer connected, who is suffering in isolation? Who do you know who is no longer connected that you need to say, hey, that we need to encourage? Because you see, the other function is encouraging each other, to support each other when times are tough, to spur one another on to love and good deeds. The Bible tells us that one of the things that we need to do is to build each other up, to build each other up. So if you are connected to Christ and part of his church body, you'll be stronger next year spiritually because we are here to simply build each other up. Ben Maxson, he says the following. He says, part of our role in this new identity of being a church is to reach out and help others grow. In other words, it is not just the pastoral team that is to mentor you and to discipline you, uh, disciple you. Each one of us is a peer discipler of each other. We are to help each other walk with Jesus. It's a journey that we are on together. And then he says this, we have made this discipleship thing far too complex so that only specialists can do it. 
There is a simple way to see and understand discipleship. I walk with God and develop a relationship with him so that I can walk with and build a relationship with you, thus helping you and build a relationship with him and somebody else. Every one of us is involved in helping build each other up. That is part of what it means to be the body of Christ. We all have a part to play. Helping in building each other up. What role are you playing? Who are you encouraging? Who are you helping? God has put each one of us right here where he wants us. Just across the road, be over this way, there's a store called Ikea. And Ikea is an interesting store. In fact, in 2009, some Harvard researchers stumbled upon something interesting that they simply called the Ikea effect. And the Ikea effect says this. It says, if you spend time building and help putting stuff together, then you are going to have more affection towards that than if you had nothing to do with it at all. In fact, they say you'll probably have even more affection that is rightly deserved, but they simply make the point that when you get involved, you will value it a lot more. So let me ask you, where are you up to with church? Where are you up to in being part of this body, part of this body of Christ? Because the text says that we are a part of it. God has given you a part to play. For those of you who are doing the steps to discipleship this week, you'll come across this verse in Ephesians. Ephesians 1, verses 17 to 23. And this is what it says. It says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus, the gracious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, and uh, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. It then finishes and says this, And God has placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. As I was reading this week, the resurrection power struck me again. Christ rose. He is working. He is moving in his church and through his church. Christ fills everything in every way. Yet he asks you, he asks me to be a part of the church, to be a part of it. Without you, things are missing. We said before that Jesus Christ, he is the head of the church. He is the one who makes it all possible. He is the one who makes the picture complete. But are you playing a part? Are you playing a part in his spiritual body? Because we need you. God's church needs you. We need your gifts. We need your talents. We need your passion. We need your energy. This is the most exciting thing happening. It's God's church here on earth. So let me challenge you today. What role are you playing that helps with serving, connecting, sharing, worshipping, growing, don't wait for a nominating committee. God is the one who places things anyway. God wants to use you, your skills, your talents, your compassion, your passion, your energy. Let me challenge you. How faithful are you in being a part of the body? 
in making commitments to continue to attend, to continue to reach out. Maybe today the challenge for you is that you need to step up and you need to join a church to make the picture complete, to make it complete. Or maybe it's time for you to go out into the world and be church, share his love with others. In 2008, the Russian Orthodox Church discovered that there was movement again in a certain town. And 10 years ago, they had abandoned their church building. But because there was spiritual interest again, they decided, well, perhaps we can use that church again. So they sent some people from their headquarters to go and check out that church. But when they got there, they discovered that the church had absolutely gone. It simply wasn't there. It was the same block of land, but it had gone. They decided to get to the bottom of this, and as they did, they discovered that some of the villagers from the nearby town had said that they had come and they had knocked out the bricks one by one and sold them to somebody else, and when they sold them, they received a ruble, or about four cents. And so one by one, this church was chiseled away. It was brick uh, by brick by brick, chiseled away until eventually when they came to check on it there was nothing there it had all gone are you chiseling away or are you fulfilling your part are you being a part of what God wants you to be and building up complete the picture because our text today says this you are the body of Christ what an incredible privilege that is. You are the body of Christ. It's all about God, but look what he does. He gives us a part to play in it. A part to play in it. God comes to us. Jesus, who has died and who has risen again, he comes to us and says, Go be my body. Go be my hands. Go be my feet. Tell others in the world just about how much I love. Come love them. Come together for worship, for sharing, for serving, so that we can grow together, so that we can connect together. There is no plan, plan B. You are the church. You are my body here on earth. Church, go and be church. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. I invite you as fellow members of the body of Jesus Christ to stand as we close this service with prayer today. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the incredible privilege that you give to each and every one of us. I want to thank you for the various gifts and talents. I want to thank you for what we have in here, that none is more important than the other, that the only way to work effectively is to work together. And Lord, we can see that you are the head of the church, that it's all about you, but you invite us to play a role. You invite us to play a part. And we just want to thank you for that incredible privilege that you give to each and every one of us. And Lord, as we go from this place, help us to reflect on this. Help us to ask in our own hearts and in our minds, well, if you have placed me where you want me, what is it that you want me to do? What is it that we can do? And Lord, we thank you that you have given us guidance. We thank you that you have given us direction. Because as we look at that first church, we saw that they were all about growing disciples, followers of you. We can see they were connecting, they were serving, they were sharing, they were worshipping. And Lord, they were doing this waiting for your soon return. We do the same as well. And now I pray that as you leave this place, that the Lord will bless you and keep you that the Lord will make his face to shine upon you, that the Lord will be gracious unto you, and the Lord will grant you peace. We pray this in your wonderful and saving name. Amen.